Hey, Jeff, Mo, I'm just, uh, just give me a couple of seconds. I'm uh, setting up a little bit and I'm putting uh, one of the articles out for people who haven't um, downloaded it yet. Just give me a couple of minutes and then we'll be moving forward. In the meantime, can somebody just send a uh, message in the chat so let me know if you can hear clearly and if you can see what see clearly and hear clearly and let me know if you saw the message we just posted make sure it's working correctly and if you need to um, you need to log in in order to uh, post in the chat room and also we will be um, taking you know questions on on this material as well as other questions you may have on some previous um, broadcasts that we've done as well as you know some of the information we've published recently like the Okra Okra complex article the soul of our combo that we just released last week so if you have some questions you know you can just post them up in the in the chat and we can take care of that but somebody just send me a quick message in the chat. Let me know you can hear us clearly. Got to make sure it's working correctly. Okay, give me one second and then we'll, we'll be getting started. Okay. All right. So, anybody can you just send me a message. You can if you need to log in, just log in. But I just want to make sure everything is clear before we move forward. And to log in, all you need to do is just give your email address, and it's a quick process. And I just want to send out uh, one message, let people know that we're broadcasting, and then we'll be straight. Okay, hold on one second. Okay. Okay, so you hear me good? That's cool. All right. Okay, you all can see the messages up there. Oh, well, the, the link that we just posted. <clears throat> and that's the article that we're going to be talking about today, Trade Beyond Pong. I know um, somebody had some confusion about what we were going to be covering today because we had a couple of events that we had posted on Facebook, but we, we're going to be covering Trade Beyond Pong today. And then any other questions you have, we can also cover that. So we can cover some of the information, some, some of the questions that people had about uh, Afurakai, Afuraikai. Um, we are going to do a separate broadcast on that detail, but if you, if you have questions on that or any other publication, any other information that we have, you know, on the website, you can post your questions as well. But the primary focus, the first focus today is going to be on Trade Ground Poem. Okay? So, all right. So... Michiamo Eneye Akanpo Nanasom Da Medinde Ojirafo Kwesi Ra Nehempata Khan. My name is uh, Ojirafo Kwesi Ra Nehempata Khan. Today is Akanpo Nanasom Day, which means Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestral Religion. I'm Ojirafo of Akwamu Mine, Amarukai Tifi Mu, which means the Akwamu Nation of North America. We have been doing a series on um, Afurakani, Afurakani, ancestral religion focused on the Akan tradition, but in, in spe specifically, but 
Afurakani, Afurakaidi ancestry religion um, in general. So anytime you study an authentic expression of Afurakani, Afurakaidi or African ancestry religion, you will, you know, be fed culturally and spiritually and intellectually, and you'll be able to understand your whatever branch or expression you come from or you're connected to. So if you study Akan traditional religion, it'll give you better insight into the Yoruba tradition. If you study the Yoruba tradition, it'll give, give you better insight into the Igbo tradition, because if you're studying an um, authentic expression, we're all dealing with the same Abosom, Orisha, Vodou, the forces in nature. We deal with the Nananoman, Samanfo, the honorable and, uh, ancestresses and ancestors, the, honor, the Nananoman, Panyinfo, the honorable elders and elderses, the Kra and Krawa, which is the Ori Inu, the divine consciousness. So all across the board, the fundamental concepts are the same. They're just different names based on language and culture. But fundamentally, the cosmology is identical from ancient Kanit, Nubia, and ancient Kemet, uh, Egypt, across the board in Afuraka, Afurakai, pre uh, Egypt, pre Kemet, and you know, post. So when we talk about Akanfo Nanason, we, we may be focused on the Akan tradition, but you know, the cosmology, the principles are identical acro across the board. So what we did was we started off. We had a three-part series, Nana Som Ne Amamre, which was is ancestral religion and culture. So we, first we dealt with cosmology, the foundational cosmology, and then we dealt with, including the nature and function of the Kra, the divine consciousness, the soul. Then we dealt with um, the ne next piece, that was the first piece. Then we dealt with the Nana Nun Samanfo, the nature and function of the ancestresses and ancestors in Afurakani, Afurakani ancestral culture and religion. The third piece was dealing with the nature and the function of the Abosom, which are the deities, the goddesses and gods, the divine spirit forces that animate all created entities, specifically like the sun, moon, stars, the earth mother, the rivers, the oceans, and so forth. Um, so we deal, dealt with that in three part series. Then we dealt with in an 11 part series the Akradin Boson, which in Akan culture there's a specific, specific set of Abosom which govern the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies which uh, govern the seven day Akan week, which is the same seven day week that is used in European cultures because they stole that from ancient Afurakani, Afurakani people, Akanfo, and so forth. So the Abosom who govern, major Abosom operating through and animating the sun, the moon, and the various planets. We dealt with um, each one of those Abosom in, in a session. So we had an 11-part series on that. We also dealt with Asase Afua and Asase Ya, which are the two Earth Mother Abosom. And then we dealt with, uh, we started this series on the creative Abosom. So we dealt with Nyonkompon and Nyonkonton, who is Ra and Rayet in ancient Kemet and Kani, and Yonkompon and Yonkonton in Akan, um, Da and Aida Huedo in Vodun and Odumare and Oshimare in the Yoruba tradition and so forth. So we dealt with uh, those two creative powers, the creator and the creatress. And we're showing the differences between their nature and their function in relationship to the Supreme Being. The Supreme Being is Amen and Amenet, the Great Father and the Great Mother, who unite to function as one entity. It's like a male and female unites to create a child. So you have the great father and the great mother. That's the supreme being. And they give birth to Ra and Rayat, the creator and creatress. So the creator and creatress creates the world, but they are governed and directed by and subordinate to the supreme being. So we talked about the Yonkampon and Yonkanton. We also uh, did a session on Odomaikuma in Akan, who was called Atem Kepra in ancient Kanit and ancient Kemet. And we showed the etymological origins of Odomankuma and showed that it's Odoman, Koma, Odoma, Kopa, Atoma, Kopa, Atemu Kopa, Atemu Kepa, Atem Kepra. We went into detail about that in the nature and function of Odomankuma, Atem, sometimes called Temu Kepra in ancient Kemet. 
So now we're going to deal with uh, Twedrium Pong, which is another divinity in our Khan culture. Now, um, okay, we had a quick question. Is Amun the same as Amen? Yes. So typically when, and just to go into a little bit of detail, when people, when you see the spelling um, of the name of the great father, Amen, typically is spelled with the medut, or the hieroglyphic symbol for the A, and then the symbol for the M-E-N, with, and also the line for the, the wavy, what, what looks like a wavy line for the letter N. So it's spelled A-M-N. And often, the whites in their offspring will put different vowel placements between the M and the N to facilitate pronunciation, but they're not um, sure exactly how it's pronounced. Now we've had different dialects in ancient Kemet. We spoke different dialects, even in our tra- uh, languages today. In contemporary Afurak, Afurak, Kai, we have different dialects. In our Khan culture, for example, you have, for example, you have the term for female is in Asante Tree, Oba, with the A, with the rising A, Oba, but then in Akwamu or ek- and Equiapem Tree, Oba becomes Obea. So the A switches to an A. Or you have Nyanko, sometimes pronounced Nyanka. So in ancient Kemet, sometimes there were different dialects, but typically the name is pronounced Amen. You have in Coptic, in some dialects, you have Amon, which you know passed over into um, Greek as Amon or Amun, the way they would spell it, or sometimes they spell it A-M-M-O-N. But typically, the reason why you see the spellings of Amon and Amun is because the whites and their offspring do not want us to understand and recognize that Amen, the great God, the supreme being, male, is the same Amen that Christians and Jews and uh, Muslims uh, invoke the title that they invoke at the end of their prayers. So of course they're not invoking the real divinity because they practice the fake religions with fictional deities, Yahweh and Jesus and uh, Moses, Allah, and all those characters are absolutely fictional. We go into detail about that in the Kuku Tum Tum, the ancestral jurisdiction. But what they've done is they've appropriated different descriptive titles of divinities, certain aspects of their functions, rolled them up into fictional white characters, gave them a false human history, and placed them in Palestine a couple of thousand years ago so that we would begin to follow them instead of you know embracing real culture. So. The reason, so that's the major reason that they don't give the proper uh, pronunciation of Amen is because they don't want us to make the automatic connection. Wait a minute. Amen is the actual God. And Amenet is the goddess, the great mother. There's not just a father. There's a father and a mother. So you have Amen and you have Amenet. And in Akan you have Um Amen and Nyame Wa. So Nyame the great God in, in Akan culture is the same Amen from ancient Kemet. Nyamewa is the same Amenet from ancient Kemet. And sometimes they spell her name Amunet or Amonet and so forth. But it's basically deception. They, they understood that if we started making connections, we would realize the fallacy of their pseudo religions. We would begin to reject them, which our people are. So they ran that little game for about a hundred years, but it's starting to, you know, it's being exposed now. So that's that's the primary um, reason. Okay, uh, Major Rosso, brother, I saw you just popped into the session. So okay, so we we, we want to deal with Trade Ram Pong, and the reason we we're doing this uh, creative divinities session um, and series is because of what we were, similar to what we were just talking about. The whites and their offspring started promoting the foolish idea of monotheism for political purposes. Monotheism is the product of the inferior mind of the Caucasian. They are not capable of communicating with the supreme being. They don't have that capacity. They don't have that anchor within their spirit to have that direct communication. The anchor is the Ka or the Kayet, the soul, the divine consciousness. They don't have that. So they're not capable. They're like a cell phone that has some circuitry, but they don't have service. And if you have a cell phone and you don't have service, you can dial numbers all day long, but you have no connection to the frequency, so you can't communicate with anything. You just have a vehicle 
but you have no access. If you don't have a ka or kayet, or we call kra or krawa in, in Akan or an ori inu, as spoken in the Yoruba traditional, or se lido, as the people, the phone people, ewe, ewe people say, uh, pronounce, you know, refer to that organ. If you don't have that, then you cannot communicate with the supreme being, you can't communicate with the forces in nature, you can't communicate with the honorable ancestresses and ancestors of Afuraikai, of course. So since they cannot do that, and they wanted to control us, they were invading our civilizations for thousands of years. But militarily, we were crushing them for thousands of years. So after a while, they realized that the only way that they might be able to gain some control over the people was to corrupt the ancestral tradition. And that didn't happen overnight. It took them hundreds of years, and it didn't just happen with them attempting to corrupt the tradition. They had to wait until civil wars were breaking out, and when people were in conflict with one another, and then they would jump on one side to help one side against the other side, and introduce false concepts. People who were disgruntled with society would join along with them to try to crush the other people that they had been against for sometimes centuries. So some of them would accept some of these foolish concepts for a political expediency so they can get access to assistance or uh, you know, armaments to help them wage war against their people who were enemies with them for, for centuries very often, sometimes even longer than that. So that's how it crept in. But their idea was to take us away from our focus on the actual supreme being and the abosom that we have access to because of our blood circles. We have access to the abosom of our blood families because of, you know, our inheritance. Our first ancestresses and ancestors were possessed. Some of them were possessed by the spirits of the abosom, just like we get possessed now when we drum and dance and sing and pull libation and so forth. The abosom will possess and move through someone. So when that energy moves through the body, it transforms the cells. It gives you energy, but it transforms the cells of a person. And when that person then uh, copulates and has a child, the child's DNA is a little bit different. We're not talking about some foolish extraterrestrial foolishness or some 12 strand DNA or some foolishness like that. We're simply talking about there's a different kind of energy, a different kind of inclination. So now the children are connected directly bloodwise to that abosome and that abosome will possess during ritual practices. People will be get initiated become initiated as priests, priestesses, and, and other offices in society, and the whole clan, after a couple of generations, will vibrate at the frequency like a welcome mat for that particular abosom, and we, carry that, we say we carry that abosom in our families. So we become what we may call an abusia bosom, or a family divinity. It's not just because we decided to go and worship a specific divinity, it's because a force in nature governs the clan. It governs the people in the clan. We resonate at that frequency. So, and, and that's, that's just an example, but that's across the board in Afuraka, Afuraika. Okay, did I see another? Okay. So, so we weren't just, you know, worshiping just anything. This is blood transmission. We have that access and authority to deal with these abosom, these forces in nature, because our blood, our DNA, our melanin, our abatum resonates at the frequency of the same force in nature and therefore we're connected to certain achinebwa animal totems who are governed by the same force in nature. So when you see people talking about animal totems, no matter what the Afurakani, Afuraikaitani culture is, you'll see that the people in a certain family, a certain clan, and we talk about this in the Okra Okrawa article, they're connected to certain abosom, they have certain dietary taboos, certain social taboos, certain achinebwa or sacred animals, because those animals, they resonate at the frequency of a certain force in nature, and we resonate at the same frequency, so those particular animals are like our family members, so we can't kill them for any reason, because it's like killing one of our cousins, one of our uncles, one of our aunts. So that's, that's the way we have it. So we carry these abosom in our blood. So and the whites and their offspring didn't want us to listen to the actual forces in nature who use us as physical vessels in the human sphere to communicate with other 
Afurakani, Afurakaini human beings to bring the message and consciousness of the Supreme Being into the human community. They didn't want us to listen to the forces of nature. They wanted us to listen to them. So they had to put forth this foolish notion that first the deities were not, they had no agency, they had no power. And then they had to put forth the notion that the deities didn't exist at all. And then they had to put forth the notion that you need to be ridiculed if you even believe that a deity existed outside of the one fictional deity that they put themselves in the position to be representatives of. So they attempted to wipe out through literature and through war, <laughs> warfare, wipe out the whole notion of gods and goddesses who actually exist. And it was an incremental process. It took them over a thousand years just to get that whole process going. And they still promote that process through, of course, Islam, Judaism, uh, Christianity in the West promoting the foolish idea of monotheism. So in reality, they can't communicate with any divinities at all. So they manufacture a false divinity. They say they're the representatives of the false divinity. Sometimes they make the little false divinity a cracker like Jesus, fictional deity. Jesus wasn't black or white. Jesus doesn't exist at all. Um, they make themselves a representative of the false divinity. And then they add fragments of functions and descriptive titles from ancient divinities like Amen, like Shen Su, Neferhetep Heru, the son of Amen and Mut, and that Shen Su Heru divinity, which is different from Heru, son of Asara and Aset, but there's another Heru divinity called Shen Su Neferhetep Heru. He's the son of Amen and the great goddess Mut, or the great Ntoro Mut. So just like you have Asara, Aset, and Heru, you have Amen. Mut and Shensu. And Shensu, Neferhetep Heru, is where they get the corruption Shensus or Jesus or Yeshua, and then later it's corrupted to Jesus. And then they take that hawk headed divinity who operates through the moon and is a spiritual force in nature and say it was a cracker walking around in Palestine, or some Negroes believe it was a black male walking around in Palestine when they try to blacken up a false tradition and then say that, you know. This was a real character. And then, of course, they're the representatives. The whites and their offspring become the representatives of that fictional character in the world. And then that wipes out the traditional, the real religion. And then we begin to you know, follow the whites and their offspring. So monotheism was created to brainwash the blacks, brainwash Afurakani, Afurakani people, and keep us away from attuning to the actual forces in nature and our insomnifo. We don't, not to listen to them, but to listen to only the whites and their offspring, the you know, representatives of the fictional one God. And if you can only have one, and only one group of people who are the representatives, then you can control the people. If we're listening to our Unsamanfo, listening to the actual gods and goddesses in creation, they will teach us to exterminate the whites and their offspring, to wage war against the whites and their offspring. They've always said that for thousands of years, and we've always done that until we stopped listening. So they understood that process and that's why they moved forward with that. So that bleeds into um, the mindsets of some of our people in contemporary Afuraikai. So when they're writing about or teaching about ancestor religion or traditional religion, or they'll say African traditional religion or indigenous religion in Afuraka Afuraikai, they will attempt, because they've been brainwashed and they hold on to that false notion of monotheism, they would take the various Abosan, or the various Orisha, and some Vodou, and try to conflate them all into simply names or titles of the Supreme Being. First, they have rejected the female Great Mother, and then only focus on the male Supreme Being, which is foolishness, which is the dissexuality or homosexuality of whites and their offspring. Then they will say there's only one male creator and he created the world. They'll conflate the creator with the supreme being, which is false. And then they'll say all these different deities, they're not really deities, they're just different quote unquote aspects of the one of different uh, names or titles of the one God, which is pure foolishness because they've embraced final theism. In reality, and some people, some of the so-called comedic uh, priests and priestesses and 
people who have manufactured comedic spiritual groups, they engage in the same false process. They promote the idiocy of monotheism because they're not really in tune with the actual forces in nature. Being in tune is not just meditating or imagining them, imitating rituals, um, repeating rituals or learning the language, the medutu, and repeating it you know, perfectly, imitating the rituals we see on the walls, dressing up in clothing, changing your diet, doing some meditation, and memorizing some you know, uh, didactic literature or something like that and then calling it a tradition or making some connections with some Orisha, calling it a tradition. But then when you turn around and say, you know, the people of ancient Kemet were monotheistic, it just shows that you're not really dealing with any actual Ntoru, Ntoru to any Abosom Orisha divinities. You're still controlled by the foolishness of the whites and their offspring. So they'll say, Amen is the great God. He, was, he created the world and all other spirits were just aspects or reflections of Amen and he's the one soul God that's foolishness. Amen is the great God. Amenet, also called Amenet, Ra'et, Amen Ra, Amenet Ra'et, the great father and the great mother and they give birth to entities, conscious living beings, just like you give you and your spouse give birth to a child who's a conscious living being. Amen and Amenet give birth to divinities who have their own consciousness their own motive power, their intelligence, and they uh, function in harmony and under the direction of Amen and Amen. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's the backdrop of why we have the, these sessions. So Tredrian Pong, just like in Yonkum Pong and Yonkum Tong, Oda Mankuma, when you read about these names, some of the Ghanaians who are, of course, brainwashed with the monotheism, they'll say Tredrian Pong is just a name of a Yonkum Pong. Tridrian Pong is just a name, a powerful name, of Nyame. They don't mention Nyame Wa, the Great Mother, at all. They just mention the male Nyame, which is a red flag, of course. And then they say that Tridrian Pong is just a name of Nyame. So we dealt with the Yonkum Pong, the Yonkum Ton, Odomon Kama. Now we're going to deal with Tridrian Pong. Tridrian Pong is actually the Abosom, the divinity, Kepra, in ancient Kemet. The beetle headed divinity is sometimes shown as a, just a beetle, sometimes shown as uh, the body of an Afurakani man with the head of the beetle. And then there's a female divinity, Keprit, who also, um, she's called Usaset Nebet Pet, and often she wears the Keprit, the beetle symbol on her head. But we're going to focus on Tredrian Pong because this name is um, corrupted in our Khan culture and we need to get to the bottom of that. Now, if you look at the, the etymology, chere or tre in Akan, when you say tre pong, is chere, sometimes shortened to che or tre, then dria, and then pong. So let's look at the first part. Tre is the root, it means to pull, to drag, to lug, and so forth. So to pull something in the Akan culture, in Akan language, to pull, to drag, to lug is tre. Um, for example, uh, when you say mframa tre amunukun means, well, well that means to drive, so it means to pull, to drag, and to, you know, to lug, but it also means to drive, so you're moving something. So you're pulling or pushing, and that's tre or trede. So there's a phrase we mentioned in the article, mframa Tre amunukum, which means in Frama, the wind, Tre drives or pushes amunukum, the clouds. Now, Trede or Chere or Tre also means to lean, to lean upon, to incline, and so forth. So you have a Tre meaning to pull, lug, to drive, or to push, but it also means to lean upon. Now, Dria can mean a couple of things. Dria means stick, it means wood, it can mean tree. tree. Um, but first, let's, in fact, we're going to get to, let's deal with the chere or trede first. When you look at the symbolism of Kepra, the beetle in ancient Kemet, you typically see the beetle in the sky pushing the sun across the sky with his two legs. 
Now the dung beetle, which the beetle Kepra is named after, um, the dung beetle, what it does is it rolls a balls of dung and they get larger and larger. It gets on its uh, front two legs and uses its hind legs to push the um, b ball of dung across the landscape. And it pushes and it's just constantly pushing. And it's a, you know, it's a very interesting sight and people have you know, watch dung beetles for thousands of years and use their symbolism because they look at their tenacity, look at their focus. Uh, the dung beetle is one of the few, or so far for Europeans, it's the only animal they know about, insect they know about, that can use moonlight and the Milky Way, the, the light from the Milky Way to navigate at night when they're pushing the ball of dung so they can use that starlight to navigate. And that's something that, you know, has been interesting for uh, European scientists because they never encountered that kind of uh, intelligence coming from any other uh, animal form or insect form. So people have been observing the dung beetle for thousands of years. We observe it in our Kong culture. We have a number of different titles for the dung beetle and other beetles. In ancient Kemet, Kepra is the great beetle pushing the orb of the sun, the Aten, across the sky. So it's, the symbolism is exact. Now, Kepra, in the text of Ra and Aset, sometimes um, you know, you'll hear it called Ra and Isis and so forth. Um, when Ra gets sick and Isis or Aset comes to heal Ra, in part of that text, it's often quoted where Ra says basically, I am Kepra in the morning, Ra at noon, and Atem in the evening, in the setting sun. So you talk about the rising Aten, the Aten at the peak of the day, at its strongest, you know, most vigorous power, and then the sun setting at night. And when we talked about Odomankoma, we showed an image of Atem sitting inside the sun, sitting inside the red setting Aten. And when you see the sun setting sometimes in the west, it looks like a red orb setting, and then it sets in the horizon and goes down below the horizon. Often you'll see Kepra, the beetle, sometimes pushing the sun, sometimes inside of the sun um, at sunrise. So Kepra is akin to the explosive power of the sun, where uh, Atem is akin to the consuming power of the sun. And then Ra, operates through the radiant power of the sun. The sun itself is called Aten. So Kepra is not a sun god. Atem is not a sun god. Ra is not the sun god. The sun divinity is Aten and Atenit. Ra and Kepra and Atem utilize the sun as a physical transmitter, the most powerful physical transmitter of their spiritual energy in our solar system. Stars are transmitters of energy, the most powerful transmitters of energy, of course, in the universe. So, um, with respect to us, so the one that, that of course, that we um, utilize, of course, is the Aten in our solar system. That's the most powerful transmitter. So, the most powerful organ of, that can be utilized is that star, and Kepra and Keprit, Ra and Raet, Atem and Usaset utilize the sun as a transmitter of their energy. So Kepra and Kepri represents that expansive, explosive power of um, solar energy. Ra operates through the radiant power of solar energy, the burning power. Atem um, operates through the contractive, consuming power of the solar energy. So that's the difference between the three. They're like three different organs in your body. For example, the lungs and the heart. Uh, working together as one unit. They are not conflated into one entity. The lungs are separate entities with their own functions. The heart is a separate entity, but they all work together for the benefit of the whole. And that's Ra and Atem and Kepra. So when you see Kepra in the rising sun, he's pushing the sun out of obscurity from, from the um, underworld at sunrise and pushing that ball up into the sky. And then sometimes you will see Ra sitting inside the sun during the daytime and he has uh, the head of a hawk 
and he's sitting inside of the sun. So trede, the root tre meaning to drag or to pull, like the beetle pulling the ball of dung, or to drive, pushing the ball of dung. You see that same thing happening in ancient Kemet with Kepra pushing or lugging or driving the great ball of the sun across the sky. Now, when a beetle um, drives the ball of dung across the landscape, at some point they bury the ball of dung. Then the beetles, the male and the female, go into the ground underground and then they mate. And then the female puts, plants the egg inside the dung and it, you know, it, it gestates and so forth and eventually the new life springs forth from the dung. Now it's the same process. You have Kepra and Keprit uh, moving the ball of the sun, the Aten, across the landscape of the sky and then at sunset that ball is buried and it goes into the ground. And then there's a union of Kepra and Kepri, of course. Um, there is a planting of energy into the sun. The sun goes through the 12 hours of the night and then eventually to be reborn um, at, at sunrise in the east. So you have Chere, Tre, meaning to pull, drag, drive, and so forth, and also Chere, to lean upon. In tree, again you have the beetle leaning upon the sun, pulling the sun, dragging the sun, and so forth. So let's look at the etymology of the term che or chere in Akan and where does it come from. In ancient Kemet, you have titles Kepra, Kepa, um, Keper, Keper Ra, and that's a connection with Ra, but the beetle itself. Kepra or Keper. Now, some versions, and we have all of this in the article, instead of Kepra or Keper, you have Kepa, sometimes Kopa, and if you look at the Coptic, the late Kemet um, dialect, it's spelled, the vowel placement is an O, so it's Kopa or Shopa or Chopa or Chope. This is where we get Odoman Koma or Odoman Kopa in Akan. But you also have a form, um, uh, kereb, or kereb. Now the first part, kereb, is spelled with the medut for the kh symbol, um, the a, r, and b. In Coptic, it's pronounced kereb, and we have that in the article. That kereb, meaning beetle, scarab, is where the t English term Skereb or scarab comes from, meaning the scarab beetle. It comes from the hereb or hereb in Coptic, meaning beetle. Then you have a version, hereb, spelled with the K H um, A and R R. Hereb, and it means a form of beetle, it's a form of kepra. That particular form in ancient Kemet, hereb, come, is uh, manifest in Akan is chere. So chere or chere, when you look at the KH, the medu for the KH, it can be pronounced K with the K sound, it can be pronounced with the CH sound, it can be pronounced with the SH sound. It's very similar to the CH letter combination in English because that's where it comes from. The CH letter combination in English can be pronounced with the K sound, like in the word chrome. It can be pronounced with the ch sound, like in the word check or change. It can be pronounced with the sh sound, as in chagrin or charlotte. So <clears throat> you have those different pronunciations because you have the same pronunciations in ancient Kemet for the medut of the k sound, the dark circle, typically. Um, so you have chere, which can be chere, but it can also be chere. In Akan, the tw can be pronounced chwe or che. So when you hear tredriampong, sometimes they pronounce it chedriampong, chedriampong, or tredriampong. Um, the word for drum is sometimes written as achene, and sometimes it's written with the TW. It can be pronounced atrene or achene. Um, so that's just a 
just an example of how the TW can also be pronounced like a CH. So you see TRE or CH, TRE DRIAMPONG, CHE DE DRIAMPONG, and so forth. So when you see in the article, you see the CHE DE from ancient Kemet, meaning CHE DE, scarab, beetle. This is where you get CHE DE, or CHE DE, and AKAN. And A CHE DE, we said it means to pull, to love, to draw, but it also means to drive or to push, and it also means to lean upon. Well, there's also a term achere in Akan, which means a kind of beetle. So now we have the direct connection of achere, meaning a kind of beetle in Akan, chere in Kemet, meaning a beetle. Chere, meaning to drive, to push, to pull, to lean upon in Akan, also the word for beetle in Akan. And when you look at the iconography in ancient Kemet, the great chere is the great beetle, Achere, who leans upon Chere, pushes Chere, pulls Chere, the great orb of the sun across the landscape of the sky. So that's, that's the origin there. Now the second part is Dria. Now when people are looking for the etymology of the term, they're listening, they were listening to the sound. How does it sound? Trium Pong. So they said Pong means great, Trey, they knew means to lean upon, it also means to pull, to drag, and so forth. And then the other part, tre, dria. So they assumed that dria could only mean what dria means is stick or tree or wood, you know, wooden stick and so forth. So they said, well, it must mean tree because that's what it sounds like when we hear it. So it must be spelled chere, dream, pong. So it just must mean trede, which means to lean upon or incline upon, dria, tree, and pong can mean great, but mpong can also mean, pong can mean to fall, mpong can mean not fall. So they would say it must mean chede, um, to lean upon, dria, tree, and mpong, not fall. To lean upon a tree, but do not fall. And they said that was just a title or a descriptive title of Nyame or Nyonkampong, meaning the dependable one, like a tree. You can lean on this tree, but you'll never fall. So even if you're going through something you can, and you're about to fall over, you can lean on this strong tree, but it's de dependable. So when you lean on it, it's so strong that you can lean on it long enough until you can get your bearings back and you can stand back up on your own. That's the etymology that's, the, that's often produced for this term because Drea sounds like the term for stick, uh, tree, and so forth. What we're going to show is the Dria is actually connected to the word for sun, but at the same time there is a connection to the wood and the tree and so forth. In our Khan culture you have two W's. One W is similar to the W in English, like way or weight, but then you have another W that sounds like the WR combination in English. For example, example in the word wrath. So the word for sun in Akan is typically spelled O W I A O A W I A or E W I A depending on the dialect. But it's not O Wea or E Wea or A Wea. It's the other W that sounds like the W R. So when you hear it pronounced, it sounds like Oria or Eria or Aria. So when you put those two together, twe is not twe dria, meaning lean upon a tree, it's twe ria, lean upon the sun. Tre dream pong, pong means great. Tre dream pong means the tre, to lean. Dria, the sun. Or chere also means beetle, so it means the great chere, beetle, who leans upon tre or chere oria the sun. Tre dria pong means pong the great beetle who pulls, draws, drives, and leans upon the sun. It's the exact same title, chere in Akan for beetle, chere in ancient Kemet for beetle. Connected with Ra. Ra of course operates through the sun, so you have the great beetle, 
Chede, Driam, Pong, leaning upon the sun, pulling the sun, dragging the sun, and driving the Oriya, the sun. So if that's a direct connection uh, etymologically and cosmologically from ancient Kemet to Akan culture because we carried that notion directly with us. Now, in ancient Kemet, and here's a connection between Odria, uh, the piece of wood or a stick or a tree, and Oria, the sun. What is the connection between a piece of wood and the sun? In ancient Kemet, you have a certain kind of boat that's called Wea, U, A, A, sometimes they write it as U, I, A, Wea or wa, but sometimes wea. And it's called wea n ra, meaning the boat of ra. And when you look at the medutu that makes up the um, spelling of the term wea, it is, you know, the, the letter for A, which is the, the eagle for the, the aspirated A. Then you have the reed for um, the A, sometimes pronounced as an i sound. And then you have um, the A again, and sometimes you have, well, I'm sorry, you have the U, the chick for the U, then you have the reed for the I, sounds like the I sound sometimes, and then you have the medut of the eagle for the A, and then you have the determinative symbol, which is a boat, sometimes it has the circle of the sun above it, Ria meaning it's a boat, and it's a solar boat. Sometimes you'll have the determinative symbol is a piece of wood, a stick, and it's showing on one hand the boat is made out of wood, it's a wooden boat uh, made out of planks, and we show pictures of those, those specific solar vessels made out of wood um, in ancient Kemet, we show it in the article, but this particular wea or boat is the wea nra, which is the boat of Ra. That's a title of a specific solar boat. We have a picture of the uh, Wea and Ra of Khufu, the Pera'a or the Nisu Khufu, um, so called Pharaoh from ancient Kemet, in the article. So, Wea and Ra is the boat of Ra. It's the boat that the divinity Ra sits in inside of the sun when it's moving across the sky. So, the boat is a vessel. One of the determinative symbols of this boat is the sun, which in Akan is called Ria. One of the spellings of it, the determinative symbol is not the sun, but it's a, a piece of wood, a stick. And in Akan, that stick would be called Dria. So the Dria determinative symbol, as an Akan person would see it, and then they also see the sun, which is Oria. That's the connection. Ria and Ra becomes Ria and Ra, or Ria, Oria, Eria in Akan. The sun itself is a vessel for Ra. Yes, we say when you see the sun, you see Ra. When you see the sun, you see Ra'et. But the sun itself is called Aten in ancient Kemet. So Ra is not the sun itself. Ra operates through the sun, penetrates the sun, um, illuminates the sun, gives it power for it to radiate. So he's the force and power in the sun, just like Ra'et is a female power operating through the sun. But they also operate through the black substance of space. They operate through the earth, just like the heat of the sun um, penetrates everything on the planet. Ra and Ra's Ed's energy penetrates all created entities, but the most powerful entity it penetrates, of course, is the Oriya. But the Oriya is the vessel of Ra. It's not Ra himself or Ra Ed herself. It is a vessel. And in ancient Kemet, that's fully delineated. The the sun can be called the Ria, Wea, N, Ra, the boat of Ra. And when you see the boat, you see the sun inside the boat. And the reason why they had the sun inside of a boat sailing across the sky is because the sky is seen as a big mass of water. And if you're going to have a ball of fire moving through that big mass of water, of course, it's going to be inside of a boat so the fire doesn't get put out. So you have the Wea and Ra the vessel of, wa vessel of Ra. One determinative is the sun itself, which in Akan is Eria. One determinative in the, to represent the vessel is the wood, wooden stick with a piece of wood, which in Akan is called Dria. So when you say Tredriampong, 
or Chedri on Palm, you're saying the beetle, Chede, Drea, who pulls the Odria, the sun, and the great beetle who pulls the sun. So that's where we get that information from. Okay, so, so far, any questions on those etymologies? And they're all laid out in the article. We just wanted to highlight the specifics of it, but all of it is laid out in the article in detail. So any questions on that so far? Let me get a drink of water real quick. Okay, so as you're reading the um, article, you have a better, you know, you have more clarification on the details about, you know, why these different titles have come into being and how these things have been corrupted by people who have accepted the foolishness of monotheism. Now, we also have the notion of the heart, and we mentioned this in the Odomankoma article, and we mentioned it in the uh, broadcast that we did on Odomankoma. But the heart itself is called Ab in ancient Kemet. Uh, Kepra is associated with the heart because when a person died, when they're mummifying the person, they take all the organs out, the major organs out except for the heart. They leave the heart in the body and then they will put a scarab, you know, a Kepra, a specific little um, amulet um, in the form of the beetle on the heart. They will call it a heart scarab or a heart Kepra on the bottom of the uh, sculpture of this, this talisman, this, this amulet, um, will be a prayer, which is in chapter 30 of the Per M. Heru Papyrus of Ani, the Sheftu of Ani. And it's the, the prayer is talking about asking the heart, when the heart is being weighed against a feather in the judgment scene, after the person has made their transition, and their Ka and their Ba are waiting the judgment scene, and Tahuti is weighing the heart, against the feather of Ma'at to see if the person um, was living in harmony with Ma'a and Ma'at. If they were not, then their heart would outweigh the feather and then their heart would get consumed by Amut, the divinity that consumes uh, disorder. But if they passed that t test, then they could live in the ancestral realm in Asamando, as we call it in Akan, in harmony with the Nananum and Samafu and Asamafu Pa, the honorable ancestresses and ancestors and those good ancestresses and ancestors in our families who may have not been spiritually cultivated highly, but they were good people, and they live in the company of them Samanfo. So when you pass that test, you can live in that aspect of the ancestral realm. Um, so what you'll see is, you'll see the heart being weighed against the feather. In the, on the bottom of the heart scarab, or the heart kepra, the little talisman that's in the form of the beetle that's placed on the heart of the deceased body, there's the prayer to the heart, asking the heart to not speak against the person during that judgment scene and basically tell the truth about how the person lived their life, how they live in harmony with order, don't speak against me so I'll, my spirit will not be consumed by um, Amut. So that is an association with the heart, Ab, with Kepra or Kopa. Now we show in the Odomankoma article that that form Kopa in a Coptic Chopa becomes Koma in Akan. And Akoma in Akan literally means heart. So you have Koma or Kopa from ancient Kemet. Koma meaning heart. Kopa meaning Kepra. That's the heart beetle, the beetle, scarab, heart talisman, and so forth. Ab in ancient Kemet means heart, but there's also the term Ab or Ab Ba in Kemet, which is another title of Kepra the beetle, and you will see the actual Medut for Ab with the determinative symbol of the beetle Kepra, and it means the flyer, but that's a form of Kepra. So his name is Kepra Kopa, but one of his names is actually Ab, and Ab meaning the beetle is also Ab, the heart. Those two are directly related because Kepra operates through that region during life and also, you know, in the death process when that heart is being weighed against the feather. Now, when you look at uh, Kepra bringing things into being out of nothing, when they talk about the sun rising, 
there's the darkness, the nothingness, and then the sun rises out of the darkness and there's a manifestation. And Kepra is pushing the solar disk, the Oriya, the Aten, from darkness, from no thingness, into thingness or somethingness. He's bringing things into being out of nothing. When they talk about Kepra dealing with evolution or coming into being, bringing something into being out of nothing. So when you look at the Ab or the heart, it reflects that kind of energy because the heart is the pulsation of life within the body. The Ankh force or the life force that moves within the body, it is um, pulsated and the rhythm of life is sent throughout the body, it pulsates throughout the body because of the heart. The heart brings that pulsation, that palpitation of life through into the body out of nothing. Just like your spirit is hidden like Amen and Amenet you can't see it, but it's manifest because, of course, you can feel the energy and move it and so forth. The heart is constantly beating. It's bringing life into the body out of nothing. It's constantly, the one thing, you can stop breathing for a while. You can hold your breath for a minute. Some people can hold their breath for a minute or two minutes and be okay. Um, but one thing you can't do is you can't have your heart stop beating. As long as the heart is beating, then their life, the onk force, is palpitating and pulsating through um, the body. It's bringing the palpitation of life, which is some people would consider a mystery, but in reality, when we're attuned with our kra, our krawa, it's not a mystery at all, but they would see it as a mystery that there's an invisible force that's constantly causing the heart to bring something, life, into being out of nothing. This is also why you see the term ab not only meaning heart, it means thirst, it means desire, it means will, it can be the seat of quote-unquote emotions. Um, when they talk about meditating with the heart and so forth, all these things are associated with the heart function, but the energy that surrounds the spiritual heart. So when you talk about thirst, desire, will, um, emotions, emoting, that's uh, reception and transmission. Thirst, desire, will, and so forth, the heart pulls in blood, the blood carries oxygen, the oxygen carries the onk or the life force, and then it transmits blood to every cell in the body through its palpitations. So it receives, that's why you, when they talk about ab or heart, it means the actual heart, but it also means thirst or desire and so forth. That's because the heart constantly receives. It's quote unquote thirsty or thirsts and it has desire, the desire to receive the life force itself or else you wouldn't be alive. So it receives but then it's also the center of quote unquote emotions or emoting or externally moving or motivating moving something out. So it receives, it pulls, draws, lugs things in and then it pushes out, it receives and transmits. Chere Driampong, chere or tre, to pull, to draw, to lug, and tre meaning to drive, as we said before. So it receives and it transmits. Ab means thirst or desire, but it's also a seat of e motions, external motions. So that's connected to, and then of course, ab in Kemet also means it's a title of the beetle Kepras, the title for a form of beetle. We also have an Akan, Abba, which is defined as a title of a form of beetle. So you have Abba, meaning beetle. Ab, or Abba, in, Ak in Kemet, is a title of a Kepra, meaning beetle. Then you have the Ab, which is thirsty, draws in, pulls in, but then it also emotes energy, emotive power, and then you have thirst, pulling, and so forth, desire, will, emotion, all that associated with the heart, all that associated with chue, meaning to pull, but also to push. All of those things are all rolled up into the cosmology, all rolled up into the functions of the divinity. Ab also means to dance. Now, what's the association with the heart and with dance? Or they'll say when you read the term ab, meaning dance or gymnastics or something like that in the Medutu, 
they don't understand the cosmology associated with it. Just like the heart brings things, the life force that's invisible, it brings it into being out of nothing and transmits that energy. Once it receives it, transmits it to every part of the body. That's the palpitation of life the rhythmic pulsing of life throughout the body, the heart is constantly pulsating. When you are going through certain kinds of emotional reactions, the rapidity of the pulsation increases, and then when you have different kinds of emotional reactions, you know, you know the pulsation or the palpitation decreases, the frequency decreases. That's rhythm, that's the rhythm of life. So dance is just a ritual replication of the rhythm of the heart. So it brings the certain forms, certain dance forms, certain um, connected with abosom, connected with insamanfo. When we bring certain energy into the world, um, when people get possessed and the abosom begin to dance, sometimes abosom will just walk around. Sometimes they will sit and communicate. Um, this is the abosom, the orisha, the ntoru, ntorutu the Vodou and so forth, the Arusi, the deities, the forces of nature. Sometimes they will sit, sometimes they will walk, sometimes they will put hands on people to heal people, but sometimes very often they will dance. They will you will bring that energy into the body and then transmit that energy through movement. The movement of arms, the movement of legs, the turns, the movements all emit energy into the human sphere, the Afurakani, Afuraikai the human sphere. The person who is being possessed at that particular point becomes the heart, the ab, the tridrium poem, the center for tridrium poem, the kepra, the one who is pulling the energy in, ab, thirst, ab, desire, and so forth, and then e, molding, or externally molding or moving the energy out for the benefit of everybody in the community who's connected at that point. Just like the heart palpitates. Um, receives energy, receives blood, receives nutrients, receives life force energy, and then sends that energy um, at a rhythmic pace, at the right rhythm to every cell in the body. Okay, so any questions on any of that information with regard to Tredrian Paul? Let me check something real quick. I just want to make sure that some of the questions people had asked from the article that we actually covered the ones that people asked about. So I just want to check real quick. Okay, it looks like we got to most of the ones that people previously had certain questions about. And of course, you can always send us questions um, via email to the website at any time on our Facebook page and so forth. Okay, so. If there's no questions, well, if you have any questions on the Tridrian Pong piece, this, this type of question, but if you have any questions on some of the other information that we have been uh, publishing, just let us know. We did have a, uh, we had an event, and we mentioned this in the beginning, we had an event uh, posted on Facebook talking about Afuraka, Afuraka, the origin of the term Africa. That was not a webcast, it was just an event showing people that they could go to the website and download the four-part series on Afuraka Afuraikai. So some people thought it was an actual broadcast. We will be doing a specific broadcast on that information. Um, but there was certain information that people didn't have. Some people have seen certain aspects of the article. Some people have seen maybe the first part of the series or part two or part three. Um, some people had never seen part four and didn't even know part four existed. In part four, we go into detail, more detail, basically talking about what we talked about in parts one, two, and three, but giving some of the medutu, the actual um, hieroglyphs, showing the term afuraka, afuraka, or afraka, arakat in ancient Kemet um, as a designation for the first landmass that rose up at the beginning of the world, and showing in detail that this term is has no etymological roots at all in any uh, non afurakani non afurakani culture. It comes directly from ancient Kanit and Kemet, and we go into detail about that. So let me give you the, um, in fact, let me give you the, uh, the link to that right quick for the people who didn't have it.
and it's on the uh, the OJ Alpha website. But let, I'm gonna give you the direct link for so you can see it. All right. Okay, so that's uh, that is parts one, two, and three, and then they at the end of parts one, two, and three, you are linked to part four, and you can go directly to part four. And also, we want to show you okay, and then this link right here. <clears throat> okay. This link right here is the link to the publication that we just released uh, last week on our Wukuda, which is uh, the Okra, Okra Complex, the soul of Akanfo. So it's talking about in detail um, what we actually talked about in the very first uh, webcast, uh, internet broadcast that we did, uh, internet TV broadcast that we did, which we were talking about the cosmology and we talked about uh, the nature and the function of the okra and okrawa, the soul, the divine consciousness um, in our Khan culture and also relating it to all Afurakani, Afurakani people. So we have a detailed, it's a book right now, it's in the form of an e-book. Um, it's about 50 pages, um, eight and a half by 11. If it, was, if it was a regular smaller size book, it would be about 70 pages, but we did it in the format of a, a large size format. Uh, because of just because of the imagery um, that we wanted people to be able to see clearly, so that it's a free ebook. Um, at some point, we will be very soon, probably within the next week or so, we will be uh, publishing the hard copy versions. We'll put that on the website. So what we did was we went into much more detail about the nature and the function of the okra, okrawa in our lives. So of course we talked about the Okra being the divine consciousness. It is an entity. It is your personal abosom, your personal orisha, your personal vodou that dwells in the head. So we go into detail about that. We give the etymology from ancient Kemet, talking about the Ka and how Ka becomes Kara in Akan, talking about the same entity, showing that the Ka is not the ghost. The Ka is not just the spirit that hangs around the tomb at the, you know, at the end of the person's life. The Ka itself is actually the divine consciousness, the soul, and we go into detail about that. Okay, Midase, brother, you say you saw the, you like the Okra book. So, um, that's one person who checked it out. So, and a lot of people have been downloading. We, it's only been out for a little bit less than a week, but it became uh, very, you know, a lot of people started downloading it. Um, getting some insights, uh, people are asking questions. So we are going to do some more detailed information about that particular subject. Uh, if you have any questions on that article, on that book, um, you can post the question. We did go into more detail about the Nkra and Nkrabia, which is the male and female aspect of our divine function. So we have a specific divine function to execute in the world, whether we're supposed to be a healer or a builder or whatever we're supposed to be, what kind of cell in the great divine body of Inyamewa, Inyameo, Amenet, Amen, that we're supposed to be, that we came into being to execute. Just like every cell in your body came into being to execute a specific function. Your heart cells support heart functions, liver cells support liver functions. Um, some of us are immune system cells, for example, in the great divine body of Amenet, Amen, and we carry that energy to restore order when disorder occurs in society or within our community. Um, we're naturally inclined towards that kind of behavior because that's the kind of energy we carry and that's the abosom that governs our head and governs our nkra and nkrabeya, the male and female aspect of our function. So we talk about how the akradin bosom who governs your kra, governs the direction of your life when you harmonize with that abosom. And we also talked about in more detail, the She and the Shebiya, which are the masculine and female aspects of the uh, motive force, the compulsion that we have, and the certain specific configuration of um, spiritual energy that we've been given to execute our function. 
So if you're given the function to be a healer, by inyame wa inyame, they don't just give that function or that mission, then they give you a specific configuration of spiritual energy so that you can execute that function. And that is received through the agency of your ancestry. So you carry a certain abosom connected to the mother side, a certain abosom connected to the father side that carries a specific energy. So we give uh, examples of that. And for us who were born and raised um, in the Western Hemisphere, we're talking about the abosom that we were connected to on the father's and mother's side before the enslavement process. You are a spirit who was, before you were born, you were an ancestor, you were an ancestress um, watching over the person who would later become you know, your mother or your father. You were connected to one of your, one of your parents. Um, but before you came into the world, you were a spirit. At some point you lived in Afuraka, Afuraikai, whether you were Akan or Ibo or Bambara or whatever you were, you were connected to certain Abosom. When your spirit was drawn into the womb and to one of your descendants in America, they may have gone through generations of uh, blood mixture with different Afurakani, Afuraikani ethnic groups on the plantations and different places, um, but you're the same spirit connected to the same matrilineal and patrilineal abosom, and you carry that energy with you into that womb. So even though the blood mixture has occurred, as long as you have an Akra, you're still Afurakani, Afuraikaitni, and you still are connected to those patrilineal and matrilineal abosom that you were connected to 100 years ago, 200 years ago, before you incarnated, incarnated into the womb. So we talk about the Abusia Bosom and the Eja Bosom in detail and how it's connected to the She and Shebia. So we go into detail about that. Um, okay. Okay, the brother said, talking about the term Afuraka, Afuraka, but some who are still, um, I guess, I have some misinformation about this. Um, Oh, and the brother said we should have sold the information. And now, when we first published the Afuraka Afuraka series, it, it was actually in the form of it was like one section of the journal, the Nanasom and Homa, which we can put the link up there because those journals are free online for people who don't uh, know about those. Okay, so the link is uh, to our Nanasom page on the website. So Nanasom is just our Akan term for um, Afurakani, Afurakaitni ancestral religion. And of course, Akanfo Nanasom is Akan ancestral religion. But Nanasom in general is just Afurakani, Afurakaitni ancestral religion across the board. So when we first put that page up, when we first um, published the journal and published some information about Afuraka, Afurakait, the first three parts of the series uh, were part of that journal is one section of the journal. The journal also has information about abatum, melanin, about health, um, about you know ancestral cultures, um, different things. So you'll see on that link, we did four issues of that journal. Um, the first three issues, back when we published it, first published it in uh, 13,007, which they were called the year 2007. Um, that's when the first issue came out and then we had other issues um, months thereafter. The first three parts of Afuraka, Afuraka, the origin of the term Africa, were published in that journal. Um, that journal is a free journal now. Then we published the part four a couple of years ago, and that's, that was a standalone document. And we, we are going to publish a part five, actually. But the information in the first four parts um, proves conclusively that Afuraka Afuraikad is the origin of the term Africa, cosmologically intact, um, etymologically the root is there, uh, phonetically, but not just phonetically, but also cosm cosmologically. It's not enough just to say that something has the right sound or even the right definition. If you don't understand, like we said in the previous session, the cosmology that undergirds and gives birth to these terms, then you really don't understand the culture. So you'll often hear people um, 
you know, making foolish claims because they really don't understand the cosmology. You can't understand Afurakani, Afuraikani cosmology if you're not attuned to your own kra, your ori, your say, and connected to the Unsamanfo consciously and asking the Unsamanfo and asking the Abosom for information. You can't study ancient Kemet, ancient Kanit, Yoruba culture, Akan culture, uh, Bambara culture, uh, Zulu culture, or any culture if you're an Afurakani, Afuraikani person and not recognize number one in ancient Kemet and all these different cultures, these were religious based cultures. We structured our whole society based on the directions of the Abosom. When the Abosom, who are the embodiments of divine order in the universe, operate through us because we become shrines of the Abosom in the human sphere, meaning Afurakani, Afuraikani, human beings only, because they only deal with us. We become shrines for them in the human sphere, just like they have shrines on earth, the ocean, mountains, rivers, um, different, you know, geological formations are the specific shrines for different abosom on earth. Then they have shrines within the animal realm. So you have certain animals who are associated with certain abosom because they carry that fiery energy or watery energy or whatever. In the human sphere, we are shrines for the abosom based on the agreement that we made with Inyamewa Inyame that we received our Nkra and our Nkrabia before pre-incarnation, we have a form um, that reflects the function that we were given to execute in the world. So we become shrines for these abosom in the human sphere, the Afurakani Afurakani human sphere. So when the abosom come and possess us and communicate with us, then we learn how to order our lives, order our existence based on the divine order and it reflects the divine order so we order our societies based pattern after the order of of abode the creation and that's based on communication with the abosom communication with the nananomon samafo the honorable ancestresses and ancestors and the only reason they're honorable is because they consistently lived in harmony with divine order by connecting with the abosom during their lives and they crystallize that uh, function as elders and elderesses. That's why we honor them because they live their lives that way and they became an example. So when we communicate with them and we communicate with the Abosom, then we can learn something about order and then we can order our societies. Um, that's also how we learn. The number one institution for ancestral culture is your ancestral shrine, your Nsama Nkombre. That's where you learn ancestral culture. Um, the elders and elderesses, the Mpanyinfo, become living shrines or repositories of wisdom with regard to the culture, the Amamre. However, in our cultures, in our communities here in, in America, most of our elders and elderesses, age-wise, have not been connected to the culture. And if they are dealing with anything quote-unquote spiritual, it's typically the pseudo religions of Christianity or sometimes Islam, um, Hebrewism, Judaism, Moorishism, other foolishness like that. And they have misinformation typically. So we have to spend more time connecting with those elders and elderesses who have real information, who are actually following the Abosom, who are actually the non and Samafo, our ancestresses and ancestors who are honorable. So you can't talk about ancestral culture or say claim to study ancestral culture or religion or even archaeology or anthropology or whatever, you can't claim to have some knowledge of the culture and write about the culture and you have no connection to the Abosom, no connection to the divinities that govern the culture. Ancient Kemet was not um, atheistic, atheistic society. That's foolishness. They weren't some pseudo-metaphysicians who simply empirically studied um, you know, the cosmos and then anthropomorphize the cosmos to create little characters that represents, represented myths to try to tell the stories of the cosmos and add different things to the myths to try to understand the world. That's foolishness. If you hear somebody talking foolishness like that, 
they're demonstrating, to, well, of course the whites and their offspring are going to teach that foolishness. But when a black person teaches that, they're demonstrating to you that they don't have a conscious connection to the Abosan. All black people, just about every black person, unless they're, you know, a child molester or a rapist or something like that, a uh, murderer, they have a kra, they have a ori, they have a se, and we can connect to the abosom that govern us, who we carry as shrines in our blood. Those abosom who we were assigned to before we came into the world, we can connect with them, we can learn directly from them. That's part of our mandate as um, human beings, as Afurakani, Afurakani human beings, as, as mature adults. You must align yourself with the abosom who actually walk with you in the world. If you don't do that, if you neglect it, then what you're going to end up doing is you're going to claim to be studying something about the culture and you'll produce mixed results. Sometimes you'll produce something that's intelligent, that you've observed, and then other times you'll talk about the cosmology in an intellectual way and it's totally absurd. So people who are not connecting with the abosom, um, you know, purporting to say something about the origin of the term afuraka, afuraika, and have no connection with afura consciously, the divinity afura, no connection to afuraet, or ifri, as they, she's called in the black Berber tradition, um, no connection to ka, no connection to kaet, never learned anything from these abosom who actually, you know, comprise the name and then attempt to speak on it authoritatively is foolishness. And people who have not studied anything about archaeology or anthropology or etymology, linguistics or anything like that, but who have a connection to the Kra, they can come and pick up some information and immediately understand that Afura is the divinity and Afuraet is the divinity and Ka and Kaet are the deities who govern this name and they know instantly because their Nsamanfo informed them instantly that this is the real deal. All we did was we just moved forward and proved it etymologically for people who needed some more information beyond just, um, you know, intuitively and con being connected with their insomnia. So we, we just destroyed all the foolish notions of, you know, it coming from Greek, Greece and Rome and Sanskrit and Arabic and all these other foolish things or um, Scipio Africanus and some people saying Leo Africanos, who are two different um, individuals who came from two different time periods, all that foolishness. We also expose the origin of the term al Kabulan, showing that it's not an ancient indigenous uh, term for the continent. Um, and we show the origin of what it actually means, which nobody has ever done. Most people just say, you know, they read it in Dr. Ben's book that al Kabulan is the original name of the continent. And that's it. But Dr. Ben didn't manufacture that name. He didn't just make it up. He read about it and he repeated it. And if you look at the work of Leo Africanus, that's where you'll find the name Al Kabulan. It's an old text, hundreds of years old, and that same quote that Dr. Ben uses in his books, talking about, you know, the Moors and Nubidians and other people use the term al Kabulan, you'll find that same quote in the writings of Leo Africanus from hundreds of years ago when he says literally al Kabulan, but instead of an N at the end he uses an M, al Kabulan, and he says this is what the uh, Numidi Numidians and other people of North Africa and some other people use to refer to a land. But we show how um, Gebelin in Arabic and Gebelin in Latin and Gebal and El Gabal, and this is where El Gebulan comes from. We go into detail about that in part three of Afuraka Afuraikai, the origin of the term Africa, um, and we show all the etymological connections, including the connection to the Abosom Kebu, which is a ram headed divinity, operates through the north wind, and he's directly connected to this, this whole notion of like El Gebulan and where the Weissen offspring got it from, how they corrupted the title. It's not from Afuraka Afuraka, it's a title corrupted from um, the blacks who were Arabized from ancient Kanaanu or ancient Canaan, um, an Arabized title that 
you know, was stuck onto the continent, and it's re relatively recently, comparatively. Okay, so, um, right, my brother said that, you know, some people are putting information out, basically, deliberately misinforming people about the information. So, of course, we release the information. It's free. Uh, it's a four-part series, and um, it's the most extensive, um, you know, treatment of the subject by any author anywhere, whether it's Afurakani, Afurakaitni, or non Afurakani, non Afurakaitni. Nobody had given the proper etymologies and shown the origins of the false etymologies and why they're false. You can't just give um, meanings and, you know, forms. You have to show how does it fit in the cosmology and how did the cosmology birth these terms? If you can't do that, then you're really not, you're really not teaching anybody anything. Okay. All right, so any questions on any of that information? If not, we're going to stop it right there. We, um, we're going to, next week we will probably deal with, most likely we're going to deal with Obuadie, and uh, we'll deal some more with Asase Afu and Asase Ya, the two Earth Mother Arbosom. But Abuade is actually Pata. Um, we deal with Pata to a certain extent in part three of Afuraka Afurakai. And then we also have a book, Pata Sasitim. We talk a little bit about Pata. Um, we mentioned Pata in the Abena article in the Akradain Boson page. Yeah, let me see. I'll put that up for you. Okay, so on the Akra Dain Boson page, uh, where we, we have articles on each one of the Akra Dain Boson, um, detailed articles about them, but in the Abena article, Abena is Sekhmet, and Sekhmet, in certain respects, is the wife of Pata. So we talk a little bit about Pata in that article. We have a book called Pata Sasatim, where we talk a little bit about Pata in the beginning, and then we talk more about Pata in part three of Afuraka Afuraka, the word of the term Africa. But we're going to talk about Pata as Obuadie, another title, of another Abosom in, in, in Akan culture that they typ typically misrepresent as simply a name of Nyame or a name of Inyon Kapon, just meaning a creator or a fashioner. But in reality, he's the Abosom or divinity, Pata, who's called. Obaluae in the Yoruba tradition and Da Zoji, um, or sometimes Sakpata, one of the, the male Sakpata twin in um, Vodun. So um, I think I saw another kind of. Okay, right, so, right, correct what you're saying about the spiritual maturity, that's right. Alright, so if there's no questions, we're going to stop it here. Um, check us out on Facebook. Um, we have an Akanfo Nanasom group on Facebook. We also have the Afuraka Afurakai uh, Ning site. And I'll give you that site. Where people who are studying this information in detail and connecting with others who are studying the information um, go to that site. So that's the Afuraka Afurakai And that's a site that you can join. We have forums. Um, videos, um, a lot of different information. Um, we have all the videos of the webcast, the broadcast, as well as the audio webcast, forums, we post articles, um, we check that on a regular basis. Um, okay, and, and we also have the Akanfo Nanasom group on Facebook, so you can check that out, and we post regularly on that. Um, so, That'll be that. If no other questions. Oh, you have one question. Okay, so the question was, I wanted to ask, how do you find out your Abo song? So one first we check out what we, we what we typically do, you're gonna find out through your Insamanfo, your ancestresses and ancestors, um, and you're gonna find out through, of course, your crop. Now typically what we do, 
Okay, I saw the other comment. Okay, typically what we do, sometimes people will go get a reading from a priest or a priestess. When a priest or a priestess, whether it's an Okonfo, Abosonfo, or a Babalao, or Olorisha, or um, Mamisi, or whatever, Hungan, or whatever kind of, um, or Dibia, whatever kind of, you know, cleric or priest or priestess it is, what they're really doing, if they're learning what Abosom governs your Kra, or Krawa, or what you know, Orisha governs your Ori. Real divination is simply the individual communicating with your Kra, with your Ori, and showing you externally what your Okra has been trying to show you internally. So they're communicating with your Kra. Your Kra or your Ori is your personal Abosom, it's a divinity. So when you go to the link, and you read about the Okra, Okrawa complex, the soul of Akanfo, you'll see that we talk about in detail how the Okra, Okrawa, the Ka and the Kayak, that's a deity that dwells inside of your head. It's a divinity that you can communicate with and learn from. It's a deity. Um, that it's, it's a guide, it's a divinity that works with you, um, that dwells with you throughout your entire life. So, a real diviner is actually communicating with that divinity that governs your head and the divinity will manipulate those shells, manipulate that, you know, kudu or put that, uh, you know, or, or pele chain or whatever they're using, they'll put that information, um, you know, in the patterns, they'll manipulate those patterns or give that information so they can repeat to you what your ori is trying to say or your okra is trying to say. Now, ultimately what you, what's happening is you're communicating with your Okra. Some, you're allowing somebody else to communicate with your Okra, but at some point, you're gonna have, still going to have to ask your Okra is this accurate? Because sometimes priests and priestesses are inaccurate. Sometimes it's by, you know, incompetence. Sometimes it's because they're charlatans. Sometimes they've just been taught wrong. Sometimes they've been initiated, and they shouldn't even be because the person that they've been dealing with is misinformed themselves or criminal themselves, charlatans themselves, a number of different reasons. But ultimately you're going to have to, no matter what, communicate with your own crowd. That's our mandate, that's our, our responsibility as, you know, as mature human beings to communicate with our own personal abosom. So what we typically have people do is listen to the Kukutun Tum, the ancestral jurisdiction first just once you don't have to memorize anything just to hear that information because it gives you a solid cosmological foundation uh, read the Uben Shang at least once so you can get a, a proper notion of the nature and function of ritual in our culture and then read the Wabo Jida just once you don't have to memorize anything and then you can look at the Nkomre article which is Ancestral Shrine Communication and let me post that real quick. So in that order, Kukutuntun, Uben Shang, all these are free downloads from the website. Okay. So listening to the Kukutuntun, you can listen to it, there's also there's audio tracks, but you can also, we did publish the transcript of the tracks, but it's best to listen so you can hear those names and hear the information. So just listen to the Kukun Tun Tun. It talks about Amen and Amenet and Ra and Rayat and Ka and Kayet. Um, talks about the, you know, nature and function of the Nsamanfo in our lives, the nature and function of the divinities. And then it talks about, the set. it was originally a three CD set, so the first CD talks about the cosmology. And then the second two CDs go into detail about uh, Jesus and Moses and Muhammad and Buddha and Allah and Yahweh and all these characters who never existed at all of any race whatsoever, what divinities from ancient Kemet they stole the titles from, and certain aspects of their functions in nature and applied them to fictional white characters or some Negroes trying to blacken them up to make themselves feel good and say that these characters were black when they were not. So. It goes into detail about that, but even going into detail about that true story, it also talks about the functions of these divinities and how they're related to um, how they manifest in, in the stellar realm, 
in in the solar um, realm, in the lunar phases, on Earth, in our bodies, and the different divisions of our spirit, as well as in our community, the different interactions we have with one another as a community. So we show on every level how these are both sown manifest. So you'll get some detailed information about that. U Ben Shang talks about the nature and function of libation, shrine communication, um, possession, ritual song, ritual dance, ritual prayer, um, sacrifice, different things, just giving us um, basically a message from the Unsamanfo about the nature and function, necessity and validity of these ritual practices because we do nothing that's purely symbolic. It always is functional or else we don't engage in it. For example, we, we wouldn't look at a you know, a picture of some, paint a picture of some food and put it in front of somebody if it's not functional. If you can't consume the food, we just don't symbolically sit down and, and look at food in the evening and then get up and leave. That's not functional. When we pour libation, when we have shrine consultation, when there's ritual song, ritual dance, we're communicating with our bosom, receiving information from them, and then utilizing that information to harmonize ourselves with order or reharmonize ourselves with order. So. Uben Shane goes into detail about that. Um, Wabo Jidra talks about the nature of purification and certain basic aspects of our consciousness that must be purified in order for us to move forward and embrace our culture. Very simple, you don't have to memorize the information, just look through it one time just so you can get it in your head. And then you can look at the Nkomare article. We go into detail about the nature and function of an ancestral shrine give a basic setup on how to set up an ancestral shrine, you are communicating with your great-grandparents, your great-grandmothers, your great-grandfathers. They have been communicating with you all your life. Sometimes we don't understand those communications. Um, let me put another article up just so you can. All the articles connected with um, the ancestral communication. I'll put in Komre, there's one called Nasaman Kom and the seven senses um, and Sama and Komare and Komare and then Ojirafo and uh, Akwamumai and you can actually find all of these on different parts of the website I'll just give you the direct one of the direct pages but I'll put the same article on different pages on the website just in case people had gone to the website and didn't go to a certain page. So these are the four, those are the four articles. Um, and then let me give you a direct link. Okay, so you can go to the um, you can you can go to the Akanfo Nanasom page. You will find all of them there. You can go to just be a regular Ojirafo.com index page. You will find all of them there. I put it on about five different pages on the website. So whatever page you go to, you'll find them. Um, so and it, it goes into detail about the Uncommonary article talking about setting up a shrine, a basic function of you know a basic example of setting up a shrine a basic prayer. We also, you can go to the Ning site that we talked about the forum that we have. People ask questions about that. We have, we've had forum discussions in detail about ancestral shrines, but you're communicating with your Unsamanfo. They, your grandparents, great-grandparents, the honorable ones, the ones who lived in harmony with order. We, of course, do not communicate with um, relatives, deceased relatives who are criminals or rapists or whatever. We you know, they need to suffer in the ancestral realm or outside of the ancestral realm. We don't need to pour libation to them or bring them to us. They need to suffer for what whatever they've done, you know, and go through, you know, suffer the same pain that they cause other people. So we don't include them in any libation or any invocation or evocation at all. But you deal with those honorable ancestresses and ancestors of yours those who are spiritually cultivated, who have been assigned to assist you in your development. These are your people. So you don't need somebody to go in between you and your people to communicate with your people. Just like if your great grandparents were here in the world, you can go visit them, sit down, give them some food, have a conversation, ask them questions about 
your culture, your history, what's happened in the past, what's going on, how to navigate your way through certain situations in life in a harmonious fashion without creating disorder in the process and without profaning yourself with the world in the process. That's what you're doing. You're dealing with your people and they will help guide you towards your insomnia can give you your ethnic group, your specific et ethnic group that you incarnated from and help guide you on the process of listening to your cross so you can separate out when you're getting thoughts from other people, your own conditionings or information coming directly from the abosom or your own cry. And the more you sit with your own cry, the more you, you know, attune to that process and you will learn about the abosom that governs your cry. Plus you will be given examples, you'll be given um, details, sometimes they'll speak in the language of your ancestral clan, whether it's through dreams or at the shrine or putting people in front of you who um, give you the same information you got from the shrine, people who don't know anything about you, that kind of information. So we go into detail about that in the various articles, so you'll see that. Okay. Let me see. Um, I want to make sure I got all the questions. I'm going to look through them real quick. Okay, so yeah, some people, you're saying that uh, you get some ridicule um, with people who, uh, yeah, people will get, you know, some people will ridicule people who are practicing ancestral religion. Of course, it's the height of insanity for a black person to have a picture of a cracker on their wall, one of the whites in their offspring, a spirit of disorder, and call that a deity. That's insane. Now, us communicating with our relatives, you know, that's normal. You communicate with your relative while they're here. When they make their transition, they no longer, they're no longer in a physical body, but their spirit is still active. They have a role in our lives. The whites and their offspring, there is no role for discarnate, wayward, disordered spirits in the world. There's no role for them. There's no role for the whites and their offspring in the world. So, of course, it makes no sense to them, but they understand why we do it, so they try to keep us away from it. If they can keep us away from listening to our insomnia, then they will keep us away from harmonizing with divine order. If they keep us away from harmonizing with divine order, they keep us away from incorporating law and um, rejecting disorder. They'll keep us away from expressing law and impressing hate. Order is based on law and hate, love and hate, divine law and divine hate, the acceptance of order, the rejection of disorder. Law through law, you incorporate things, objects, deeds, entities that you need in order to harmonize with divine order, every thought, intention, and action with divine order. And through hate, you reject those things, objects, deeds, and entities that would otherwise throw you off balance and keep you out of harmony with order and make you self-destructive. So just like your immune system rejects toxins from the outside, as well as cancerous cells that develop from the inside, and destroys them and kills them and expels them, divine, that's, an, um, that's a function of the divine hate within your body. So law and hate comprise divine order. The whites and their offspring want us to be self-destructive and always out of harmony and disorder because that's the only way they can control our people. So they have to keep us away from our insomnia so we won't listen to them and we won't listen to the abosom, the actual agents and embodiments of order in the universe they want us to reject order, the agents and agent to says of order, and want us only to embrace them, the whites and the offspring, who are the spirits of disorder. So they have to try to ridicule real practice because they have no capacity. They don't have a kra, they don't have a bra or a ba. We're going to go into that some more next week. They have no capacity to connect with the forces of order, so they're just spirits of disorder and, you know, like we said before, they don't have a connection just like a dead cell phone. They have no service. All right, so. Okay, one more question. To, all right. Brother asked about Black Roots Science. Um, what you'll find is, I remember somebody emailing me some, somebody emailed me some questions a few years ago about something he was reading online and he asked me my opinion about certain aspects of it and I gave him 
you know, what the information w actually was, and then he responded a couple of times, and, and it turned out that what he was reading was the Black Roots science piece, and what, there are certain things, of course, in that, that document, that documentation, which sounded good to the person, but then when he started reading deeper into it, he was repeating foolishness from the Nation of Islam and this pseudo-Black root, root Science and false information about initiation and divination and, and our true story and just foolishness, just straight foolishness. So what you'll find is in, on certain forums, when the brother asked me the questions, he actually took some of the answers and he posted them in an argument with the person who was dealing with the Black Roots, who, who wrote the Black Roots Science piece. And so it's, there's a dialogue with that particular brother, and he says, I asked this brother named Kwesi Ranehem Batal Khan, and this was his answer. Now, I didn't know at the time he was talking to somebody who was calling themselves, you know, Black Roots Science, but that's what it was. So you'll, you'll probably see that somewhere on the internet, but that's outside of some of the information that he put in there that makes people feel good and makes people attached to it once you look deeper into it and they start talking about the 144,000 and talking about Yahweh and talking about Yaqub and all that foolishness that comes from the Nation of, nation of Islam totally inaccurate you'll, you'll recognize that it's, it's foolishness okay alright so we're going we're gonna to stop it here if you have any um, any more questions you can hit us up on the afurakafuraikai.ning.com site uh, you can join that site, you can hit us up on Facebook, and of course you can just email us at, at our regular email address, nanasom at ojidafo.com. So when you go to ojidafo.com in the contact us section, you'll find that. And of course, check out the new publication, it's only been out for a little bit less than a week, the Okra, Okrawa Complex, the Soul of Akanfo, It's a lot of information in that document. And we will see you uh, next week at the same time. On Benada, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, I come from Nanasong. Mirasei.